See, the difference between a mistake and a possibility is asking what is the lesson I'm supposed to learn here? That's when it's a possibility. You are now listening to the Highlight Real Builder for Authors, the Going North Podcast. I'm your host, best-selling author of the book, Stay the Course, and Maxwell Leadership Certified Team Member, Dom Brightman. And you're going to be getting some tips and techniques to advance yourself up next. Today's episode shout out before the actual episode starts for real is the going north podcast.com shop that's sponsoring this show indeed so check it out like a library book some more new designs up on the shop and the good news is we got multiple things for you from laptop covers to mugs t-shirts pins and more variations of t-shirts indeed so if you want an extra soft t-shirt we got you covered indeed and hope we even have a new logo the wonderful going north podcast.com shockwave compass because we are shocking your system with this good content coming to your ears right now and today on the highlight real builder for authors known as the going north podcast we got another super special awesome human for you today folks that's right indeed because not only we have super special awesome humans they've also put pen to paper because today's guest in particular is an international best-selling author and intriguing philosopher he is remarkably discerning detective when it comes to solving the mystery of being a human being and from humble beginnings to his current status as a real estate developer restaurateur world traveler sought out to speaker he has revolutionized his vast life experiences into sound practical advice so you heard that right folks sound practical advice so let's give it up for the radiant and wise rob white how you doing today rob Oh, well, thank you, Dom. That was wonderful, uh, the way you announced who I am, and I'm absolutely honored to be your guest. Thank you very much. Woo, sweet. It's honor to have you on the show, man, because my goodness, like, my man's living one heck of a wonderful life, and if I'm not mistaken, at least at the time of this recording, I believe you're 77, right, or 78? I'm 78, going on 58. <laughs> And, uh, you know, very passionate, passionate and, and as alive today as I was at, I would say, 28. Uh, it, it's all a mindset. Absolutely. I'm healthy in mind and body. And I spend a lot of time reminding myself of that, Dom. You know, I mean, I get that there's plenty out there in the world that will remind me of how tough life is and how easy it is to get sick, especially with COVID. So I have to remind myself that it's just as easy to remain healthy and vital and full of energy and love and life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about, indeed. And it's definitely the right mindset to have. It's it's folks like you that are big role models for me because one of my <laughs> biggest pet fees when folks are in their 20s and 30s, heck, even teenage years, saying, oh, I'm old or I'm getting old. I'm like, man, you haven't even started yet. <laughs> like, uh, stop that. <laughs> you know, what I've learned, Dom, I would say the secret to being an outrageous success, whatever that may mean for anyone, and is you've got to learn how to talk to yourself about yourself in a way that always encourages yourself. And in order to do that, you do have to look at what's wrong to make it right. You can't just smear over things that aren't working for you with peanut butter. By that, I mean, just making positive affirmations, I'm healthy, I'm wealthy, I'm rich, I'm loving, I'm kind, I'm gentle, while underneath that you have a fear of poverty and you're angry at the world, reinforces your fear of poverty and that you are angry at the world. What I've learned to take me from nothing to something, at least I consider something, I was born and raised in a small mill town, a very impoverished small mill town, and in that small mill town on the wrong side of the tracks where there was a lot of alcohol and divorce and anger and stuff. And I was born, here's what's interesting about being a human being. You're born into a conversation. Uh, when you're born, when I was six months old, I'm just, I'm just loving life, pooping, feeding from mom's breasts, starting to look around and figure out what I'm up to. 
And then I started noticing something's going on with mom and dad. They're communicating. Now, I can't think the way I'm thinking, but I'm perceiving it. And I get this is intriguing. And so that's the conversation we are born into, the conversation your family is having with each other about money, love, life, how tough it is, how great it is, how easy it is, winning and losing. And you have no choice. I had no choice when I'm talking about me. I'm talking about all of us. I was very young and naive and innocent. So I assume that's the only conversation that existed. And what I learned was this. Life is tough and you got to be tough. And so until I was a teenager and wised up, uh, I was a wise guy. I was tough. Uh, I, would, I would do what I had to do to get what I wanted, uh, period. Uh, and I was a know-it-all. Uh, and and so of course, fortunately, I tried to pull that act with the principal of the high school my freshman year. Uh, and he pulled me in the office, his office, and he said to me, uh, Bobby, that's what they called me back then, you know, you're a winner. And you're really going to win. Well, let me tell you something, Bobby. You're going to win at losing Ooh. because that's what you have created yourself to be. Someone who wins at losing. You're a wise guy. You got all the answers. You're flippant. You got a gang around you that thinks you're smart with what you're doing and you're dumb with what you're doing. You're going nowhere. And he said, and that's okay. I just want to wise you up to one thing. You are a winner and you're winning. You're winning at losing. And like that conversation, Dom, like I'd never heard a conversation like that before. I didn't know that kind of conversation existed. And I didn't know I was, I was really getting good at winning at losing and doing whatever I could. You couldn't trust me. If it didn't work for me, I, I wouldn't keep my word. I cheat in the test rather than study for it. You know, I, I, had it, I had it all figured out. I didn't know I had it all figured out moving in the wrong direction. So yeah. From that, Dom, I went first, uh, I was the first uh, child in my family ever to go to college. And then I became a teacher for 17 years. And I realized, you know, I always dreamt of being wealthy and traveling and meeting famous people and all that. And as a Boston school teacher, wonderful job. And I loved it. I got I'm not even, I'm forsaking my dream. I really want to get out there. I'm still winning at losing if I'm compromising on my dreams. And there's nothing wrong with teaching. This is not an indictment against teaching, please. There are wonderful teachers who love teaching and they're living their dream. But it wasn't mine. So after 17 years, Dom, I quit teaching. I quit. I went to the principal. I said, this June, I'm done. It's over. What are you, crazy, Bobby? Well, you're in line for a promotion to be assistant principal next year. Now, I really want to get out in the world. My father said to me, you don't need a psychiatrist, son. You need a team of psychiatrists. <laughs> are you out of your mind? You're going to give up your health plan, your retirement plan and all that because you think you're going to go out in the world and make it. What are you going to make it in? I didn't know, Don, but I knew I was, I was here to win at winning. And my dreams were more than what I was doing. So I was walking down the street one day, wondering how am I going to make it? And I saw a brand new book on the sidewalk. Now, who doesn't pick up a brand new book? I picked it up, turned it around to see what it said. And it said, how to get rich in real estate. Well, son of a gun. I thought that's a sign from God. And I read the book by Robert Kent, and it wasn't the greatest book ever written, but I had great faith in what he had to say. And at that point, here's the big one. I had faith in myself. That's the part you got to get. If you don't have faith in yourself, a matter of fact, I'm going to push this envelope. I claim if you don't have faith in yourself and you have faith in God, it's not enough. It's God saying, hey, I can't work with you if you're not working with yourself. You got to have a little faith in yourself, a little trust in yourself. You got to trust that you are your word when you say you're up to something that's good. So I did it. Within two decades, I made tens of millions of dollars on the East Coast and West Coast in a, in a business, real estate, that I know, knew no one in, never took a course in, read one book, but I went out into life wide awake and open and asking tons of questions, making hundreds of mis thousands of mistakes, learning what they were trying. See, the difference between a mistake and a possibility is asking what is the lesson I'm supposed to learn here. 
That's when it's a possibility. And I asked that constantly. And, and then I got bored with real estate and decided I love restaurants, fancy restaurants. I go to them all the time. I spend tens of thousands of dollars a year in them because I had a lot of money back then. I still do. I'm not saying I lost it all. So I said, why don't I own restaurants? And I ended up, I owned it, started up my own restaurants and I had three incredible restaurants. How did I do that? I was always talking to myself about what I was up to in an encouraging tone, but willing to look at what is it that's got me stuck right now? What has me feeling inadequate right now? And stare right at it. And now here's the weird part, Dom. If you want to get rid of what has you feeling stuck and inadequate, own it. I would say, I feel inferior right now. And you know what I say to myself? All right, then act like you're inferior, but do this. Know you're acting that way. It's not true about you. Or I don't, I feel like I'm not that smart right now. Okay, own it. Act as though you're not that smart, but know you're acting that way. And it's not true about you. And the minute you start acting like you're not smart, like it's an act, all of a sudden, halfway through your act, you think, what am I putting this act for, on for? It's not true. And you get to choose. I am smart. And then all of a sudden, you start asking smart questions. You get smart answers. If you act on the answers, your life changes. Then there's your validation. So the secret to success that I have in my book, uh, The Maestro Monologue, that is different than most self-help books. And you've done a lot with your life and you've done it unconsciously if you haven't done it consciously. You've got to own your supposed flaws by owning it when you're feeling inadequate in any way, simply be willing to feel inadequate and act inadequate and say to yourself, it's an act and then just You'll, be the, you'll get the Academy Award for your act, but you also know it is an act. And halfway through it, or the next day, or some point, all of a sudden you get, well, if I chose to act this way, I could choose to act the opposite. And then you, you create space. You create a clearing to start thinking and feeling and acting differently. So that's my whole thing in a, in a thimble, if, you, if I may, Don. <laughs> Hey, a lot to unpack there. A lot to unpack there, indeed. And my goodness, my goodness, like <laughs> especially that powerful conversation with the principal at the time. It's like, hey, you're a winner, but you're winning and losing. It's like, wow, <laughs> no. that's impactful. <laughs> yeah, uh, I didn't know that. You see, what I love that you got. By the way, you're an interesting. Uh, I've read your your background, what you've done with your life. Uh, you know everything I'm saying. You've done with your, and you're much younger than me. You've done incredibly well. And the thing is, you want to take credit for it because in the end, I don't care what you get handed to you from life, you decide what you're going to do with it. And, and, and whether you're born in, in a rough side of town or you're born in the ritzy hill in the corner, uh, I've seen both sides that can destroy themselves with, that, with what they have. But, you know, and I've seen, I've seen both sides make an incredible life of their lives like you do and then giving back. Oh, man, I'll tell you, nothing feels better than being in service to others. That's the whole point of humanity. I know, you know, every living being on this planet, even an earthworm, is here to serve. It serves by burrowing holes so the grass can get roots and, and, and get watered, and then the birds can eat the seeds from the grass and all that. Everything is in service. And I really got in, at first I was selfish, selfish in terms of, I wanted everything for me. It's all for me. I was a wise guy. I was a punk. You know, it's all about me. Uh, and, and if you get harmed in the process, well, that's your problem. And when I finally got, you know, when I finally got, it's got to be good for all concerned. Um, if I'm doing something and I'm taking advantage of someone, first of all, karma is going to get me. Life is just electricity. It's going to come right around and whack me right up the side. They had like a lightning bolt somewhere. So for my own sake. But the other thing I really got dumb is when I was making a lot of money doing uh, building homes and then again, building real estate, uh, my real estate empire so people would come and enjoy themselves. I love that I was helping people come to the restaurant and, and have a ball and enjoy themselves. And I love that I was building homes and people would come and love the home and feel good about themselves. And I got it. It wasn't the money. It was at first, I thought, 
but there was a feeling of self-satisfaction that comes with really being in service to others that nothing, nothing, nothing else can give to you. And that's when you really feel alive and love life and you get life loves you. And by the way, Don, that doesn't mean life is just going to now lean over and give you everything. Life is here to test you. you. You wouldn't have taken form, human form, on planet Earth in a world of polarity if you weren't in, if you weren't accepting. Life is going to test you constantly. It never stops testing you. Uh, and, and the point of testing you is that you might learn a little bit more about yourself and find out, oh, my God, my potential is infinite. Every time I think I've run out, here's something else. Here's another talent. Here's another strength I can access. And when you get older, they're different than when you're younger, but they are just as thrilling to find out. You know, I have incredible open mindedness now that I never had before. And it is such a feeling of peace. I mean, it really is peaceful. It's okay if you tell me everything I just said is a lot of malarkey and baloney and, and I'm out of my mind and crazy. I'm open-minded enough to say, wow, I'm curious. What has you think that? And I really mean, I'm curious. And that peace of mind that gives me so that you and I might have a conversation to further the conversation. And here's the thing, Dom, I would know there's something I'm gonna learn from you. I learn from everybody. I have some very powerful, influential friends I learned from, and I learned from the homeless people that I'll, when I, when I stop and I give them a, a $20 bill, a homeless person, I'll have a conversation with them. I, if I, I will engage, I'm not just the cold guy slaps the 20, smiles and runs away. I'll ask them how, how the day is going. Uh, and, and you know something, Dom, I meet, if I take a $1 bill and put it in one hand, and a 20 and put it in the other hand. And I say to a, a homeless person when he's at the street and he puts his hand up in the city of Boston, can I, do you have any spare change? I'll say, which one do you want? And nine out of 10 want that $1 bill because that's what, that's what they think they deserve. And I say to them, now, are you sure that's the one you want? Or is that the one you think I want you to want? Or you think you're supposed to take? Which one do you want? And you know, the gift I get is when they smile and they take the $20 bill and they get, they deserve it. And they say, thank you, sir. And I say to the, that, them, Dom, and I mean this. No, thank you, sir. Because what a gift to me to see them smile and light up a little bit more than they were. So little things like that, Dom, that's life. That's being a winner. All the big stuff I can tell you about going to these exotic places and owning Ferraris and having four homes, two in the ocean and two in five. I have all that. That stuff is good, but it's not what is fulfilling and satisfying. It's not what has your soul smiling and loving life. Yeah. Hey, it makes perfect sense. It, and you're so right, especially when you mentioned a bit early about how <laughs> both sides of the coin, what, no matter what neighborhood you're in, like you can always get the best and worst of both parts and sometimes hooks can end up on the worst side of either <laughs> depending on what they do with their environment <laughs> yeah, well and that's what and, and clearly you you just you have learned your own unique formula we all do I, and you speak well your books are well written uh, you are a philosopher uh, and you're spreading the good word and that's you know and I am I call myself now, what are you now, Rob? A restaurateur? No. Rest, uh, real estate developer? No. I'm an author, a poet, and a philosopher. See, I declare myself what I am. Uh, when I was a school teacher, I declared myself a school teacher and I was a darn good one, but I got that's not all I wanted. So then I declared myself a real estate, a wealthy real estate developer to myself. I didn't go out in the world and just pound my chest like a silverback gorilla. <laughs> I declared it. And every day I reminded me myself of what my declaration was until I felt as though it was so. And then it seems everything started to fall in place. Oh, I had a lot of struggles. I didn't just everything fell in place perfectly. I stumbled and got up and stumbled and got up. Then I declared myself a outrageously successful restaurateur. And now I declare myself an author report and a philosopher. And when, when someone looks at me, they look in my eyes waiting for something more like practical. They're, that's it. I'm an author. I'm a poet. I'm a philosopher. 
And I love being an orthoport and philosopher. And, and that's the secret to life. You got to declare what you're here to do. There's, there's no finding going on here. Yeah, you go inside and look at what turns you on. And if you have talents and natural music talents, then you certainly want to be bent to think in that direction. But someone does not become an incredible artist of any nature without declaring I'm an incredible artist, not arrogantly, not stubbornly, not I'm better than you, just talking to themselves about themselves in the process of becoming that which they are saying they are. Oh, uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Definitely got to declare it. Indeed, definitely got to declare it. Indeed. So, my goodness. And it's kind of funny how some folks may think being an author, poet, and philosopher is impractical. Truth be told, it really is. Because, I mean, the pen is mightier than a sword for a reason. Like, there's like the knowledge we have today is because a lot of folks decided to write down their thoughts and their observations, and they're helping us today. So, <laughs> it's kind of interesting how some folks don't think that's practical. Yeah, well, that's excellent that you say that. A lot of folks, you're, you're right, yeah. You know, there's another thing I talk about in my book, The Maestro Monologue, and that is the unwanted mental house guest. You see, what happens is when I was born, and I'm you, so I, when I talk about me, it's easy for others to hear it, because I don't say when you were born, like I know something about you, you don't know. Everybody went through this. I'm born the maestro. A maestro is an incredibly intelligent, talented orchestra leader who, uh, who leads the orchestra, orchestrates the um, band to beautiful symphonies. I was born the maestro to conduct my daily affairs and orchestrate my earthly destinies so they showed up to be a beautiful symphony as a contribution to the whole universal symphony. But here comes the but. And we all have to go through this. At age two, the terrible twos are terrible for the taught because that's when the no's come rolling in. And when a child hears no for the first time, it's traumatic. He, it's a break from belonging. He no longer feels like he's an intricate and variable part of all of it. He feels flawed and fragmented. Now, he doesn't know the words. He doesn't sit there at age two and say, I'm flawed and fragmented, but he feels it. And here's the worst part. From age two to five, child psychologists claim the average child hears 60,000 no's, which means by age five, Every one of us believes and says to ourselves, there's something wrong with me. And, if, and that lie is what most people take with them through their entire life, which is why they suffer and struggle and can barely make it. Because they never, when they were naive and innocent, and they heard their 60,000 no's, and some hear very harsh no's, I know that, and it's tougher for them to get through it. But if you don't get when you decided by age five there's something wrong with you, and that's a lie, I consider that, I call that the other self. That's when you gave birth to the unwanted mental house guest I call the intruder, the other self. And that self, when it takes over your mind and takes over your action, it validates for your whole life, if you allow it to, there's something wrong with me. And you've got to be willing to look at that. And I say, call an MD. Oh, I don't mean a medical doctor. In my book, I explain that. An MD is a marvelous denial on the lie that unwanted mental house kiss is telling you. There is nothing wrong with you. You are perfectly, uniquely you with incredible talents and incredible strengths, but you're never going to find them if you listen to that unwanted mental house guest. And it seems to me, Dom, what's important to get, when we sign on to being a human being, we sign on to going through the nose, because in every culture, every ethnicity, there are nose. And, and, and the harsher the no's are, if you got a real 
a, a tough dad or mom and the harsher they are, yes, it takes more to work to get through them. But there isn't anybody, no matter how loving and kind mom is, if you stick your finger in the electric socket, she's going to go, no. And you don't hear that no as a loving, kind gesture to save you from getting a shock. You hear it as, whoa, there's something wrong with me here. And then you hear more and more of them. That's why the tools are terrible. You can't even put your finger in the, you can't even play with your boat in the, in the toilet bowl and mom's not yelling at you. No, don't do that. Eventually you think, and I just shared with you. So I say there's two of us, every one of us. There's the authentic me, and then there is the intruder. The, uh, that is the, the flawed self that I have agreed as me in my naive moments of fear and pain, childhood moments of fear and pain. And when that intruder gets a hold of your mind, it, here's what's interesting, it wants to survive. And the only way it can survive is have you forever messing up with life, validating its statement, there's something wrong with me. So that, and when you get that other self as the other self, not as the maestro you're meant to be, uh, and you can start, uh, that's the whole point of my book. Awareness is number one, and then call it out for what it is. It's, it's a lie. It's fraudulent. It's a great imposter. The intruder is such a good imposter. It will not only convince you it's you, it will convince all your friends and the whole world it's you. And those are the people who end up in jail and every, in, in trouble all the time. That's how good that imposter is if you don't get a grip on it. That's pretty good, isn't it, Dom? Oh, good stuff indeed. That's five out of four stars right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. None of, this, you know, none of this is that heavy. It's heavy and it's not heavy. If you say it's heavy, it is. If you say it's interesting, then it's not heavy. It's interesting. So I hope, even though I say it with great passion, I want you to know it's incredibly interesting to look at yourself from a different point of view, knowing there's two of you. And the next time you go to a party, if you're feeling awkward and know that's the other self is taken over, just say to yourself, oh, by the way, here's what I say to my other self. You never get rid of it. By the way, once you give birth that, to that other self, it sticks around for a lifetime. Now, it doesn't have to bother you nearly as much. I'll give you an example. I went to a party, oh, two months ago on a, on a beautiful yacht, and there were a lot of very famous and wealthy people there, and I felt awkward. And then here's what I said to myself, oh, you're good. I was talking to the other self. They had me feeling awkward. Oh, you're good. You saw an opportunity to jump in here. You got me feeling all inferior and wondering if I should even be on this uh, boat right now going to this party. You're good. By simply saying that, I now have handled it. It's not handling me. I breathe in. I breathe out. I can then show up as the maestro. By that, I mean just the natural me who loves parties and loves to meet people and loves to engage in conversations. But before I had to notice Oh, I had dressed nice and I and there, and there were some movie star there, there were pretty big movie stars. And I all of a sudden began to feel inferior. And that's when I said, Ooh, you're good. Give that intruder, that other self, an inch. It'll take a mile. It saw the opportunity. And it said to me, Are you sure you should go to the you look at who's here? Who do you think you are? I had to say, Ooh, you're good. Very good. By talking to myself about myself like I'm not myself, that other self, I created a little space to be myself, and I had a charming, wonderful time. Met some wonderful people who were wonderful to talk to, and I learned a lot, and I shared where they learned stuff, and I left the party feeling very satisfied that I was a contribution and that the party was a contribution to me. Rather than leaving the party thinking, oh, I never should have said that. That was so stupid. Why did, and then this one, why did, did you just see me? That would be the intruder who would have taken over me through and through, not only during the party, but for, for two days later, as I beat myself up for whatever I did, blah, blah, blah. See, that's amazing when you start to get that there's two of you and that other self, by the way, you would think 
someone who is 78 and been very successful in uh, many arenas of life and been all over the world, he doesn't have an intruder. I got news for you. Uh, everyone has an intruder and there are situations where he takes over. Tom Brady, how can he have an intruder? Well, my God, the guy's got everything. He's handsome, he's, he's intelligent, he's one of the greatest athletes in the world in football, it's unbelievable. His wife, beautiful, da, 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 da. You put him on stage with ballet dancers and put him in a ballet outfit, <laughs> see? Okay, you don't have to go any further. His intruder will show up and say, what's wrong with you? What are you doing up here, you idiot? See, that intruder never goes away entirely. And the point is, the more you're able to qu quickly notice it and acknowledge it and then create space to be yourself, the less it impacts you in any grave way. So that's my uh, two cents on that one, Dom. Uh, more like a giant shiny cold gold coin to me. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Like, my goodness, my goodness. So with that intruder, like making sure he doesn't really break in, <laughs> even though he's kind of in there all the time and yeah. acknowledging him, like, do you believe that's one of the keys that's really helped you to really sustain basically your well-being all this time and ha have all of these wonderful interests that you have? Because, I mean, with that Tom Brady example, it's just leaving the thing like, oh, wow, so maybe that's why my man got, got into serial entrepreneurship with the multiple restaurants and the real estate and everything. I, yes, I feel that knowing the intruder is something no one can avoid. So don't be upset. Oh, I have an intruder and unwanted, but some people don't. Everyone does. And being aware of it and handling it when it's taken care of, when it, when I decided I was going to break through to something new, always the intruder shows up to say, what's, are you crazy? What's wrong with you? You got it made right now. You got to blow it all. Uh, you, you don't know what you're talking about. I, that's when I have to say, Ooh, you're good. He, the intruder is good. It, it'll convince you. And that one statement for me is what had me go f do many. I lived with a Maasai uh, tribe in Tanzania for six weeks uh, and what I found about the Maasai tribe in Tanzania, by the way, they don't know how to lie. That's something that the more civilized we become, the better we get at lying because we're so getting caught up in looking good. Uh, we'll do whatever we can and fib and lie and do all the stuff we do to look good. If you live in, in Tanzania where there are a wild jungle beasts ready to pounce on you and kill you at any moment, looking good is not your most precious. And what I found is they are incredibly transparent. And they also get this two of them. And they talk to each other about the other self that they're not, that if they, and that will get them caught up in a world that will, will they'll get killed. They will, uh, there's a jungle animal waiting for you to get caught up. If you approach a hyena, he'll stop a human being and stare you in the eyes. And your intruder will say, oh, my God, what's going to happen? He's going to kill me. He sees the intruders taking over your body. He waits until you panic. That's the intruder. He waits till the intruder has you panic and he pounces and he gnaws you to death. If you now here's what the Maasai, the, a Maasai warrior who has two stripes over his forehead on the left side has confronted a wildebeest of that nature and he looks him in the eyes and the intruder will say, this was a big mistake. And he says to the intruder, get out of the way, I'm dealing with something here. And the maestro, that part of him that is the king of the jungle, human beings, over, as opposed to lions and, and hyenas, he will stare the hyena down and it can take seven or eight minutes that hyena will just stare and then it starts to shirk back slowly and then it turns away and runs like heck so that is what you have to do in order to become get the two stripes and become a maasai warrior you have to confront a beast that's able to kill you and you have to get rid of the intruder and stare it down and you can 
because the maestro knows I can handle anything and I can handle this. If it comes to something, I don't know what's next, but I'm ready. And that wildebeest who has incredible instinct stares and stares and gets, damn, I'm, I'm not taking this guy on. Nope. And they take off. <laughs> that's what I learned from them. And that's what I've done in many ways in my life. And I still do it. I mean, I still do it. Uh, I knew, here's what I said about COVID. Well, you're 78, 77, 76 when it started. Old people die from it. I said, let me tell you something. I'm not going to get it. Or if I do get it, I'm not going to know I have it. And for sure, I can tell you this. I'm not dying from it. And that's the end of it. End of conversation. And I, and I know people would say, well, science could say that wouldn't work. I say science doesn't know what's going to work. When you're confronting someone from that sort of self-faith, self-trust, and absoluteness. And sure enough, I mean, I did get the shots. I don't, didn't say I'm never going to get a shot and I'm going to go hang around with people with COVID to prove. But I, did, I got the shots and all that. But I never got it. Or if I did give it, get it, Dom, I never knew I got it. And again, I tell you, for sure, I'm not going to die from it. And there's, that's the end of the conversation. And the intruder has no chance for giving me a conversation about, well, maybe you ought to think that over again. See, no, there's nothing to think over again. That's the deal with me. It's a deal I made with me about me. See, nobody can interfere with a deal I make with me about me. Yeah, if I make a deal with you about me and you, Dom, certainly you have input, and I can't guarantee 100%. But if I make a deal with me about me, and I don't let the intruder in, 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 intrude, then the deal is a done deal. And I act as though it's already so, before it's already so, knowing it's going to be already so, and when it is already so, I say to you, see... I told you so. That's like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why as a poet, y'all, his wordplay is amazing, baby. That's right. Wordplay. <laughs> Robert, wordplay white, baby. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And I appreciate that uh, you noticed that. I do. I became a wordsmith writing. I wrote five books. I love words and I love to play with words. And I appreciate your appreciating, and I'm pretty darn good playing with words. Thank you for that. <laughs> my pleasure, Dave. My pleasure, Dave. So my goodness, so since you're a philosopher, is there a question that you wish you'd be asked more often when you're on these podcasts? Actually, I think that your attitude is the question that I love approaching. Your openness your, when we spoke before, your excitedness about it happening, that's the question. It's not a question that's verbalized. It's in, I'm looking at you right here on the screen. It, it's the inquiring eyes. It's the fact that you are listening. You're not waiting to add to it. You're listening, which gives me permission to speak. That's the greatest gift I think you can give me or anybody uh, is your attention, meaning it when you're giving me attention and wanting to hear what I have to say. I mean, I'll tell you what, if we all walked around doing that with each other, God, what a great life uh, it would be. So th that's my uh, answer to that question, uh, Dom. Uh, that's what I'm talking about indeed. That's what I'm talking about indeed. Definitely. Pleasure to serve indeed, because a lot of folks tend to, you know, want to wait to ask the next question. <laughs> and it might not even be a good one. <laughs> Well, you know, I, w I did an interview oh, two, two months ago, and he said I got seven questions, and then halfway through uh, what I thought was a profound and delightful answer to one, he said, we got four more questions we got to get to. Uh, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. That's enough of that. Yeah. So I get that. I, uh, in the beginning, I said, let's just have fun. And you know what? I have, I have had a ball. And one reason I've had a ball is uh, you're what I call a listening. Most people are not a listening. Uh, they're a waiting for me to answer you or give you my opinion. Uh, I see with you an openness in listening where you let me go with where I'm going and you're delighted to, to hear what, where, where, what happened, where it goes. And then if there's something you want to add or ask, you do. But I notice you pause. See, that's a gift. 
in other words, if I barely finish what I'm saying and you can't wait for me to clam up so you can get going, well, now we're just, we're a chatterbox, da, 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 like, like rhesus monkeys. <laughs> uh, one's on one brand, kick, 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 and the other one's on the other one. So my, my gift is I do, I feel I have great wisdom to share with your listeners. Your gift is you've been an incredible listening that I might share uninhibited. And I thank you for that. Yeah, it's an honor indeed. It's an honor indeed. Well, speaking of fun, fun question we're loving to ask folks for the past few months, and that is if your wonderful book, the wonderful book, the international bestseller, The Maestro Monologue, if it was a food, what would it be and why? <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Well, I'll tell you what came to mind, and I don't know why, but avocado. <laughs> And I love chips and avocado, so I got to just assume because it's such, an avocado and chips are so delightful to me. And I know the avocado is the better part of the of the meal than a chip. I'll have to say it's an avocado for me. Yes, I would like it to be an avocado that you dip in with your chips and have a ball. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so I'm talking about indeed. Actually, the second one to actually refer to the book is an avocado. <laughs> That's beautiful. I think I got to put in my next ad. My book's an avocado. You got to dip in with your chips and have a ball. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> That's right, indeed. I guess it's kind of a pun since there's a pit in the middle that can look like a ball, right? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Oh, geez. You're, you're, you must be a lot of fun at a party because, I mean, you're just easy. <laughs> yeah. If, if I'm ever in your, t if I'm throwing a party around you, I'm inviting you because you're definitely <laughs> someone who everybody would enjoy to be in their company. Thank you for that. Oh, my pleasure, D. My pleasure, D. Well, we're coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive, and that is if you're to wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again, but you're still in 2022, what advice would you give to yourself? Mm, wow. You know, that's a, that's a profound question. Now, if I was 22 with the wisdom of a 78-year-old, uh, the advice, and I would love to be a 22 year old of the wisdom, the advice that I'd give myself is all that's going on in the world is, is only testing you so that you can prove to yourself that you are very valuable contribution to the world. So don't buy into all the hecticness and the anger and taking sides, uh, get involved. Get involved in a way that it, the way you would like it to work out, but know that in the end, it's here to help you to grow and expand and be all you're meant to be, which is the greatest contribution you can be to humanity. So that's what I believe uh, my advice would be to myself uh, if I was 22. Of course, at 22, I'm not sure. <laughs> my advice would probably be much more shallow, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, it's like yeah. <laughs> Make sure you glue your toupee for decades yeah. to come, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Make sure it never falls off ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, what had you say that? I wonder, because do you know? Uh, do you know the uh, story about me that I? I don't think you know a story. Do, what? How much time are we supposed to finish this up? Hey, it's all good. If you want to share it here too, it's all good because I've heard a couple times it's hilarious and then it kind of took you to another level as a speaker. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So you had heard the story. Yeah. I mean, I used to wear a toupee, very shallow, wanted to look good. Uh, I wasn't always wise. I was very shallow, self-centered, wore a toupee. And the biggest, uh, the most important thing for me when I was bald and didn't want to be bald is every day to put my toupee on and not be bald. And I, I was a pretty good keynote speaker. I was going around and making a lot of money being a motivational speaker. And I was good at it. Uh, and I wore the toupee. And once I was in, doing a Century 21 annual convention at uh, in Vegas with over, oh God, I don't know, 10, 12,000 people in the audience, big spotlights. And I'm the keynote speaker. And I have people coming up, breaking through boards, one inch pine boards, people who look like they couldn't do it, showing them how and psyching them up when they'd break through. It was hot up there and big screen so everybody could see me. And I moved quickly with this one woman to show how to do it. And my wig fell off my head onto the stage. 
Well, I was so humiliated, I wanted to die. It would be okay if I had a heart attack right now and died. I don't know what to do. It was dead silent, and I then look behind me and there's a curtain. Now we all know there has to be a fire escape door behind the curtain. And so I just thought, that's it, I'm leaving town. So I just turned around, walked to the back of the stage, got behind the curtain and I went to the right of the stage and they could see my feet because the curtain didn't go to the floor. <laughs> and there's no no door, no no fire escape. Well, it's gotta be to the left. So I, and they're all watching, the screens are on and they can see me and I run to the left, there's no door. I came back to the middle behind the curtain. They saw me turn around facing them again because my toes are pointing at them. I opened up the curtain uh, and, and came back out to the front of the stage, dead silent, picked up the microphone and I said, this is who I really am. And I got the biggest standing ovation because we all know we're hiding something and for me to be well and i was hiding on bald for some reason i thought that was awful and it's ugly and all that and when i just said this is who i really am they all were ovating for their own sake too because there was a sense of absolute humanity in that room we all hide something. And, and you know what's funny? Here's what you want to get, Dom. I wanted a standing ovation, but I didn't want a standing ovation like that. But in the end, that standing ovation is the best standing ovation I ever got. Because for the first time in my life, I stood in front of seven to 10,000 people being myself and saying, this is who I really am. No act, no BS. None of that fluff. Here it is. And you know what I found out? They loved that I am much more than the fluff act, pretentious, pompous I am I was before that. Uh, and I never, I went home without that wig on. And when I got off the plane and I, all my friends stared at my forehead like, what the heck? And I didn't make <laughs> one thing of it. Yeah, well, they knew I was obsessed with my wig. So that's, yeah. So when you said that about the wig, I didn't know you had read that story. Yeah, that, and if you want to know the most powerful moment in my life, it's when I was willing to present myself as myself to the world without covering any of it up and having the whole world stand up and ovate and say, we love the way you really are. Because that's all we want everyone to say about us. And everybody wants us to say it about them. That's what I'm talking about indeed. That's what I'm talking about indeed. Always love that story indeed when I've heard it a couple of times. Like, you know what? That is so good. And it's actually funny how sometimes we seek something and <laughs> in a roundabout way, we end up getting it in a way we never even imagined. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I want an understanding ovation. Oh, I would love to get one. Best one I ever got in my life. Thank you for uh, opening that uh, door so I could share that story. I always love to tell it. So people learn about themselves. It's not about me. You know, what are you hiding? Uh, what is it you're so afraid people will find out about you and then they'll hate you and think you're awful? What you're going to find out, just be yourself. They forgive you all your flaws because, because for heaven's sakes, in some way or another, we're all flawed to some extent if we're going to call them flaws. Our own unique perfection. That's what it is. Thank you, Dom. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Rob, indeed. So for those who enjoyed you and want to dip into more of what the wonderful works that you're doing and all your books and all that wonderful smooth jazz, what's the best way for folks to do so? RobWrightMedia.com is my website, and uh, you can learn all about me there. And yep, my book, uh, The Maestro Monologue, is found on Amazon, where all great books are sold, if you want to peek at that. And I thank you for this opportunity, Don. This was a, 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 I had a very good time. Thank you for that. Woohoo! Well, there you have it, folks. Head over to robwhitemedia.com. We're going to put the link to that wonderful site of Rob's in the show notes. So be sure to snag a copy or two of his wonderful book and share it with your friends, family, cat, camel, dog, heck, even share it with two rabbits indeed so they can dig a rabbit hole and take that wonderful magical maestro, the mindful maestro, down all the way to the center of the earth, folks. That's right, indeed. That's right, indeed. That's right, indeed. So any parting words before we close up shop, Rob? 
I think that if you're taking away anything from this conversation, I hope it is that pay attention to the, to the fact there's two of you. And when the other self gets a grip on you and that's whenever you're feeling inadequate in any way, call it an attack. Simply say, oh, you're good. I see you're trying to take me over. Because just doing that offers you, opens the door that you can be more authentic and natural. So that would be the gift I hope I gave you, if any other gift. Thank you, Don. Thanks a bunch for tuning in and setting aside some of your time to listen to this wonderful podcast, Going North. If you really enjoyed what you heard, do me a solid and share this with your network and someone that you care about that would get something out of it, too. Be sure to subscribe to hear more and heck, even check out the backlog if you would like because there are hundreds of episodes to choose from and they just keep getting better and not better. 